travel literature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, really one laugh. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you about that today, but uh, I actually uh, come from Aberdeen. Uh, all the way from Aberdeen. Anybody from Aberdeen in the crowd? Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Fantastic. Anyway, Aberdeen is a city famous for having its uh, seagull, seagull snatching sandwiches, sandwich snatching seagulls, and being the hometown of Michael Gove, the only man I know who combined education and comedy to more devastating effect. Anyway, Aberdeen is a very beautiful city, and it looks best when you've turned your back on it. <laughs> That's not my joke, I stole it from a 19th century German author called Heinrich Heine. Remember the name? He's gonna come back again. Okay, so I first discovered German travel literature at a lecture at the University of Oxford, a city famous for its car factory and for rat syphilis. <laughs> yeah, rat syphilis, he founded the Bloomington Club in case you <laughs> Okay, so uh, I was at this lecture, uh, also at it were the future stand-up comedian Richard Herring, uh, the future British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and uh, George Osborne should have been there, uh, but unfortunately he was on holiday on Peter Mandelson's boat, which is a shame it wasn't Robert Maxwell's boat. That's a joke from 1988, uh, so uh, you know, so it gives me a sense of the audience there. Uh, but that was, ironically enough, the year at which I was at this lecture. I learned that. Um, Travel writing, like stand-up comedians, like stand-up comedy, is an exercise in the creation of a persona. The travel writer tries to construct themselves as someone who is more intelligent, more sensitive to what's around them than the normal tourist going around in the package tour and so on and so forth. So, as an example of this, we have this man here, um, not me, him, uh, uh, who is uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe who is famous for having a, an unpronounceable name, and also for his uh, two-part tragedy, Faust of Fun, which he wrote with his sidekick, <laughs> Richard Schiller, in the, in the 1780s. Anyway, uh, there's old uh, Goethe. Now, Goethe, sick of the political satire he had to write in the uh, court at Weimar, set off for Italy in 1786 to refresh his poetic muse. And if you read his uh, journals of the time, he creates himself very much in this kind of personality of someone who pays much more attention to the works of classical antiquity and the Renaissance paintings and all the churches, and he slags off all the other tourists who just wander around ticking off things on the Lonely Planet and not looking properly at what's going on. Yeah, but then if we actually look at Goethe's notes from the time, we see something else. We see that he a, hung around with all his compatriots, loads of Germans in Italy, drinking beer. Uh, secondly, he had his picture taken by his friend, Tish Bang. He made fun of the local natives, uh, the dirty, lazy Italians, as the Germans see, seem to think of them, as kind of Uh And uh, he had sex with uh, lots of loose women. Uh, and he also wrote poetry, so he did basically everything that we do when we go on holiday. <laughs> and uh, in the end, uh, he... Uh, yes, so we can think about travel writing uh, as, on the one hand, the construction persona, but also about sensory experience. Going abroad is about, you know, getting some sun, getting some sea, and so on and so forth. And what's also important is the medium by which we travel. My research is really about the intersection between travel writing and technology. Goethe, uh, travel by stagecoach, which is not the bus company, obviously. <laughs> uh, an authentic comedy vehicle, in fact, the stagecoach. Heine, you remember Heine? We had Heine earlier on. Heine, Heine went on foot. He was a romantic poet. He went on foot and he tried to get close to nature, you know, to feel it under his feet. But unfortunately, in the 1830s, when Heine was writing, um, the trains arrived. <laughs> so look, there's a train coming. Yes, indeed. Uh, they sort of appeared on the horizon. Heine says in the trains, interestingly enough, trains improve our family lives. They distance us from our relatives. <laughs> now, the rhyme's not good. That's my translation. But the sentiment, I think, is correct. Anyone who has stood on a lonely provincial railway platform in Inverness, in Elgin, Cowdenbeath, late at night, desiring to get back to the bright lights and the bright clubs of the big cities where the comedy celebrity comedians perform their road shows. They will know what Heiner is saying. Okay, so there we go. So the trains arrive, they change travel culture in Germany for good. They bring in an age of scientific positivism, they bring in an age of technological control, and basically a German renaissance dead. Heiner buggers off to Paris where he dies of syphilis in exile. <laughs> And uh, the trains obviously also lead to those two uh, German uh, 
trips of the 20th century, should we call them, expansionism. Uh, the second of which, if you're working out where I'm going, was led by uh, a man called Adolf Hitler, uh, who uh, was famous for his love of Alsatians and his lack of artistic talent. Okay, but I don't want to mention the war. No, I didn't even start it, so we're not going to mention the war. We're going to move on past the war. Don't uh, I teach German studies, so you know, it, it kind of keeps coming back. Anyway, there was a time when I did this routine with a Hitler t-shirt on the back. It was a really horrible Hitler t-shirt from the 70s of Hitler's European tour. Anyway, go look at Yeah, no, it's really bad. Anyway, it's not as quite as bad as some of the jokes come out. Anyway, so... Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the, this Second World War thing, we forgot about that, yes. So, in, uh, Germans still love nature and they still love to travel, in fact, they still do these days. But they, after the Second World War, they weren't quite so welcome in very many countries because of uh, something we're not going to mention or anything like that. Okay, so uh, there was, however, Ireland. Okay, Ireland had remained neutral. Now, here's a song of a little historical fact you didn't know. Why did Ireland remain neutral? Basically, because Hitler was an Irishman. This depends on the knowledge of Irish terminology, okay? So, as a joke I heard when I was eight. Uh, Hitler's original name was Richard Murphy. Okay? And when he went, he left Ireland, went to Germany and changed his name to Dick Tater. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, the old ones are the best, they say, and that's about 35 years old. Okay. So, back to Heinrich Bell. Back to Heinrich Bell. Heinrich Bell, wandering around. I tried to escape from Germany after the war, which is turning into this economic powerhouse. Car factories everywhere. Um, economic miracle, money, materialism. He wanted to get back to nature, back to, back to good old Ireland. So you can buy Burl's Irish journal today, still. Um, it comes adorned on the cover with a 100% purely authentic pint of Guinness. Just in case you forgot what Ireland was about. If you thought Ireland might have been about the fact there are no jobs, there's no abortion, there's mass immigration and Father Ted. So, if you were confused, then Burl will take you back to Ireland. Now, there's one anecdote that doesn't make it into Burl's book. It was an evening he spent in the pub with a future sit-down comedian, Dave Allen. Now, um, they discovered over a long evening of drinking that they had a mutual distrust of the Catholic Church, which fair enough, a mutual love of whiskey and cigarettes, and also a penchant for travel. Burl, if I come back to my original joke, Burl had done a tour of the Soviet Union in the 1940s with the Wehrmacht and the Reichsbahn. Unfortunately, the return journey was rather ruined by the breakdown of this on online seat reservation system, mostly due to Russian army intervention. Um, uh, Alan had wandered lowly as a cloud through the, through the mountains of County Wicklow in the 1950s looking for a pint during the great comedy wars of those years which were brought about by the Catholic Church's intention to ban the use of contraception in stand-up routines. Uh, they wouldn't be very happy with the material that comes later on tonight, maybe put it that way. Anyway, so, Alan eventually had to join Terry Wogan in exile in England. <laughs> exile is obviously a very different topic. Uh, it's a very, it's, I mean, what I've been talking about really here is, is an escape from the industrialized world back into nature. Those who suffer exile are those who leave by the skin of their teeth, suffer political persecution and so on. And German history has a lot of examples of this. As I mentioned, Heine dying, dying of syphilis was actually in exile in Paris. He couldn't live in Germany anymore. Just one of many. Uh, but imagine, imagine that you had escaped by the skin of your teeth and were sitting in your new neighbourhood, in your new country, and there was a bus going round and round your neighbourhood with a slogan on saying, why don't you just fuck off? <laughs> in a very polite, English, David Cameron kind of way. Um, but the topic of exile is a topic for another, another time. Um, this uh, travel is supposed to broaden the mind. I don't know if I've managed to do that, but uh, uh, this journey was supposed to last eight minutes. It's reaching its destination. And uh, so I will conclude by saying, be he Stuart Lee, be he Pope Banquet, or be he Dr. Beeching, may God go with you when you travel. Thank you.